Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Brida Sweeney and I'm here with my colleague Patricia Martin and we're presenting our paper today on the use of informal control and the evasion of formal management, uh, management control by middle managers. Um, thank you to Whishker for the opportunity to present the paper. Um, I'll present the first half of the paper and Patricia is going to present the, the second half and the findings and the discussion. So um, this is the first airing of our paper, so we really welcome any feedback. Um, there is a Q&A function uh, which you can ask questions and then we'll, we'll deal with the questions at the end. So maybe first I'll talk a little bit around the motivation and, and the kind of the purpose of, of the study. So um, in the accounting literature, we have a, a stream of literature on what we call management control systems. So the word control seems very negative, but actually control, it's about really managing organizational performance and looking at how um, organizations can meet their objectives and, and ensure that everybody is working towards their goals. And recently in the literature, um, we've become interested in this idea of control combinations and packages of control. So um, up to recently, a lot of literature focused on different types of control systems like a balanced scorecard or a budget or um, um, HR type systems. Um, but it's, it's increasingly recognized now that these controls combine in different ways and that it's important to understand the relationships between controls in a control package. Most of the work that's been done so far in control packages have focused on formal controls. So we don't really have much understanding about the relationships between formal and informal controls. Um, and obviously, you know, recognizing the full array of, of control possibilities is important both for managers in practice, but also for academics in understanding, you know, the, the weaknesses or challenges that, that are faced by organizations. And um, the other side is, is the levels that have been focused at an organization. So quite a lot of the studies that have been carried out have been focused on senior management, or they haven't really specified, they've just dealt with managers in, in general. Um, so Marginson's paper, even though it's back in 2002, there have actually been very few studies since on the middle manager level. But we do know that middle managers carry out a wide range of strategic activities. They have access to many layers in the organization, so they're a potentially powerful player, and they're central in explaining key organizational outcomes. So this study where we've carried out, the purpose is to examine the extent to which middle managers engage in different strategic roles, and then to look at how middle managers use different management controls, that's both formal and informal, in combination in carrying out these roles. So I'll talk now a little bit, this was just just give you an overview of it, I'll talk a little bit about the, the literature that we've relied on. So we know that middle managers perform many different uh, roles um, and traditional research would have viewed middle managers as mainly implementing strategy. You know, and that is the kind of the, the bread and butter for middle managers that mind in the shop. But it's now recognized that they perform strategically significant roles that would previously have been confined to senior management. So there's lots of changes have taken place in organizations of flattening empowerment. Um, so middle managers have a lot of key roles here. They're referred to as both loyal implementers and also change agents, recognizing that this more kind of um, um, you know, dominant role that they now have in, in strategy setting. They're also seen as this linking pin between the senior and lower level of ma uh, lower management. And they're also a level that commonly engages in unsanctioned work. Now, this unsanctioned work is, is often a uh, productive type of work, um, but they need to engage in work that maybe hasn't been fully approved by a senior manager in order to, to get work done because they're in such a critical role and they're trying to balance between different sides. So, Overall, that we have little insight in the literature into how they perceive their roles. So there's lots of different types of roles and they've increased. And we have a lack of clarity on how organizations develop conditions for systematic engagement by middle managers. Um, and the conditions we're interested in are the management control systems, how they're using those. Okay, so we said, well, okay, let's get a handle on the types of roles that middle managers engage in. So we took a look on Google and Google wasn't very uh, complimentary on middle manager's role. So um, a lot of the, the, the images on Google's were really showing middle managers as being pretty superfluous in the organization that they're standing around watching all of the work being done. Now, obviously that's not really the case because we, we know from the academic literature that, that middle managers have, have 
really key roles in the organization. So when we turn to the academic literature, we find a, a very helpful um, categorization here, or a typology of, of different types of middle managers roles. So Floyd and Woldridge, they, they define four different middle manager roles. And they break these roles up based on two different dimensions. One is the direction of the strategic influence. So depending on whether it's upwards, that is towards the senior management, or downwards towards the lower level, they categorize the different activities. They also categorize them based on what they call the cognition of ideas. Okay, so depending on whether the ideas are divergent ideas that lead to change, or whether they're more in integrative ideas that lead to coherence and lead to a kind of a focused action, then that also determines the types of roles they're carrying out. So if we take the upward roles firstly, so this, the first upward role, role we look at here is the championing activities. So this is about the, the persistent and persuasive communication uh, of strategic options to upper management. So basically the middle managers are, are selling entrepreneurial and strategic initiatives and they're potentially shaping future strategy. So this is a benefit to middle managers because if they participate in this bottom up motion of ideas, it potentially allows them more control over the future. OK, the other one that's also upward is what about Floyd and Muldridge called synthesizing information. So synthesizing information is about gathering, interpreting and reporting information upwards. OK, and this information may form the foundation for future strategic change. So again, it's offering them the opportunity to influence senior managers' perceptions. So basically, they're, they're taking internal and external information. They're filtering it. They're looking at it in the context of opportunities and threats for their strategy. But they're also giving this information meaning when they're communicating it to senior managers. Okay, in terms then of their downward roles, well, the first one here, facilitating adaptability. So this is about what's called fostering flexible arrangements. So when middle managers do this, they're encouraging the lower levels, I suppose, to, to engage in activities that are maybe outside those that would be expected by the top management. So they're encouraging the lower levels to be alert for changing conditions, to experiment, to adopt, to adapt work practices in response to the changing environment. Now, sometimes senior managers will be unaware of these activities, so often they're not sanctioned and, and they may even be kind of subversive. They may require middle managers to seek out resources to foster these emergent ideas. And then the last one, which is the one that middle managers are really associated with, is the implementing deliberate strategy. So as we said, this is kind of the bread and butter of their role. This is where they're taking the strategy and they're translating it into particular actions that the lower levels need to carry out and they're monitoring whether or not those actions are, are meeting the targets. So a range of different um, strategic roles there set out by Floyd and Woolridge, focusing particularly on upward and downward. One of the aspects is not focusing on is horizontal. So I suppose a lot more horizontal type activity now as we have more matrix, matrix type structures, as we move away from the hierarchical type arrangements, um, so that now is becoming important, but um, studies that have been carried out using Floyd and Woolridge are finding, even though it was developed in 1992, that this kind of overall categorization of the four different types of activities still reflect the, the, the type of work that middle managers carry out. Okay, so we turn now to, to management control systems. So I suppose first is, you know, what, to, what is what our management control systems? So, the definition from the literature is that there are a set of many formal and informal input, process and output controls that are used by management to achieve organizational goals. And then the goals are connected by many complementarity relationships. So when we're talking about here, we're talking about all the types of controls. So your HR controls, your quality controls, your budgets, balance scorecards, KPIs, um, your vision, your mission, your statements of values, these are all part of the management control systems. And as I mentioned, that, that word control can be seen as very negative, but actually controls are, are you know, about the organization achieving its goals. 
So interesting, it, it includes both formal and informal. So we the, the dominance in the literature has been focused on formal controls, but informal are part there. And then it's recognizing this definition here is recognizing the complementarity between the different types of controls, which is just starting to get attention in the literature. Now, most of the studies in the literature have focused on formal controls and have also focused on the implementation of strategy. So how formal, how budgets, how balanced scorecards can help an organization implement its strategy. The other roles that, that middle managers are carrying out involve, I suppose, more innovation, really, when you're championing alternatives or you're synthesizing information. It involves a lot more change. So it's not just about implementing strategy. And we do know from the literature that control systems are very useful in managing innovation. So they can be used to encourage employees to engage in innovative thinking. So this obviously applies at middle manager level as well. So depending on the combination of controls that are being used, you may have middle managers who are engaging in more or less innovative thinking. They can also motivate innovative behaviors depending on your performance evaluation and your reward system. It can motivate uh, innovative in uh, behaviors to a, to a greater or a lesser degree. They can provide a comfort zone in ambiguous situations. So a lot of times when you're dealing with innovation, there can be ambiguity. And control systems, I suppose, can give a bit of certainty around maybe what, what needs to be done, what actions need to be carried out, or what's valued in the organization. And then lastly, they can provide protection. So a, a study I, I carried out with my colleague Emer Curtis, um, where we looked at innovation in an organization. And we found that because some innovation projects had a lot of controls over them and others had none, the actual the, the projects that had controls in place were protected and resources flowed to those projects. And in contrast, the projects that were lacking controls, it meant that there was no attention or no resources going to those projects. So while Initially, people can feel that control and innovation are two opposite things, that they, they don't sit well together. Actually, control is, is very important in managing innovation and can ensure that you know, creative ideas are translated into innovations in the organization and actually result in the development of something new and useful for the organization. OK, so I mentioned that we're particularly interested in informal controls and how they combine with formal controls. And it's difficult to define what exactly we mean by, by informal controls. So recently, Tucker in 2019 said that informal controls are defined by two characteristics. So he refers to his absence of a purposeful, predetermined or deliberate design. So he's basically saying the things that are unplanned or spontaneous. These are often the informal type of controls. So the, the kind of ad hoc meetings that take place where actually a lot of work can get carried out of those meetings. They're, they're part of the things that lead to the achievement of organizational goals, but they're not part of a formal control system. And then the second aspect is a reliance on social interaction or an interdependence um, between different areas. And again, you know, th this is important part where, you know, these social interactions, they, they can occur in different ways. They may occur as part of a formal control system when everybody is brought together in a meeting. But it may be the, the um, what takes place just immediately before or after the meeting may be part of that informal control system that may actually lead to an achievement of organizational objectives. Now, the literature also points to this idea of integrative liaison devices as being important for social interaction. So these are our devices or our kind of pathways that allow spontaneous contact or, or that, that maybe allow the creation of task forces or committees. And they basically break down the kind of functional barriers and they enable regular personal intensive contact between people in different areas. So these, the integrative liaison devices may be kind of informal where it's spontaneous contact. It can be just based on networks that you have, social networks that you have, or they may be a little bit more formal in terms of the task forces. So that may be part of a formal control system, but the social interaction that takes place there, there may be an informal aspect to that that does lead to the achievement of the objectives or the goals of the organization. 
Okay, so the control packages then, they comprise a lot of interdependent practices. So when we have a budget and we have a set of KPIs, they don't operate completely independently of each other, and they generally don't. So in the literature, we know that they can act as complements where using one increases the value of using the other. So for example, if we have a statement of values, and if the values are translated into a set of KPIs, then using the set of KPIs is increasing the value of having a value statement because it's been their complements for each other. But they can also be substitutes where you can use one or the other, but using them both really doesn't lead to anything more. So for example, if you were supervising the work of, of somebody, you know, and if you also, as well as supervising their work, if you reviewed in detail the work they had carried out at the end, both of those may not be necessary. So they may operate as substitutes where, you know, supervising may mean that you don't need to review the work in detail at the end, or reviewing the work in detail at the end may mean that supervision isn't really necessary. So using one decreases the value of using the other. And Bedford says that, you know, these complements and substitutes, they can have different causal forms, they can operate in different ways. So we can have what he calls compensating effects. So this is where one kind of controlled practice would counteract the weaknesses of another. So maybe you have an increased bureaucracy around one and there's a weakness because of that. And then you have another control system that allows you to maybe bypass some of that bureaucracy. You can have reinforcing effects where one control element enhances the effectiveness of another control element. Or you can have enabling effects where one control element creates the conditions for another control element to, to work effectively. Okay, also Bedford details three different causal forms for substitutes. So we can have, you know, inhibiting effects. So one control element can hinder the effectiveness of another. So um, you may attach a bonus to something and that may inhibit the effectiveness of something else because there's a bonus attached to one thing. You can have exacerbating effects where one control uh, element accentuates the detrimental effects of another element. Um, so it, it causes that to increase, but if there's a, a downside of it, another control element causes it to increase. And then what you ha can have what Bedford calls instigating effects. So one control element creates the conditions that trigger another control element to worsen the control problem. So based on that literature, there was two questions we came up with on this study. We first of all said, well, what extent do middle managers engage in different strategic roles? Okay, so we're cognizant that Floyd and Wooldridge study is, is quite an old one. And even though more recent research has found it relevant, we wanted to get a handle on really, you know, how frequently are managers engaging in these roles? Is it really implementation is the bread and butter and is 90% of their work? Or are they engaging quite frequently also in championing the activities or synthesizing information? And then the second question we were interested in is how do middle managers use formal and informal management controlled practices in combination to perform these roles? So we know there's different types of roles and it's likely that different control systems are going to aid particular roles more than others. And it's likely that maybe formal and informal will combine in different ways for different roles. So we're interested in getting more of an insight into these four different roles and how the controls will combine. So I'll hand you over to Patricia now who will talk through the research methods and, and uh, the, the findings and discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Brida. So um, to address the research questions um, that we posed in the study, we carried out a multiple explanatory case study. It was based in four uh, European subsidiaries of um, global medtech and IT uh, firms, two of each. All of these organizations are multi-billion firms with um, a number of employees in their thousands. So we're restricted in terms of confidentiality about what we can disclose about the firms. So our focus was on middle managers and uh, we interviewed middle managers across a range of functional areas. So quality, manufacturing, engineering, IT, sales and marketing. Uh, our uh, 
our main source of data collection was semi-structured interviews, uh, but these were complemented by attending company presentations and also um, the use of a pre-interview questionnaire, which I'll speak about in a, in a moment. In terms of our data analysis, we coded our data in, in Vivo. It's a qualitative uh, a package that helps qualitative uh, researchers uh, come up with different themes and, and ways of organizing their data. So we conducted within case analysis, and this was followed up uh, by cross case analysis. So moving on uh, then to our findings. So Brita presented our first research question and uh, we wanted to know the extent of engagement that middle managers have in different roles. So to do that, we used the Floyd and Woldridge uh, survey instrument. It consists of 21 statements and these represent work activities undertaken uh, by middle managers and they uh, capture uh, the four categories of the roles that Brida has uh, talked about. So we asked um, our interviewees on the survey uh, to a rate between never, uh, which was a, a rating of one, to very frequent, uh, which was a rating of five, about 21 uh, statements representing typical middle manager work. And our findings are, are summarized uh, here on this table. So we can see that the implementation role uh, was the most prominent or most frequent uh, for middle managers. And that was very much in line or consistent with existing literature. But what is interesting is that that role was very closely followed uh, by the other three categories. And it also uh, indicates to us that middle managers in contemporary organizations engage with all uh, four roles across the Floyd and uh, Wooldridge um, spectrum. So our interview data also supports uh, the fact that managers uh, grapple with different roles. So these quotes just illustrate this. So middle managers, they have to deal with the mucky stuff. They resolve between the blue sky and keeping the show on the road. So our interviewees, they were very much talking about being able to seamlessly alternate between uh, routine operational oversight and then switching uh, quickly into uh, a strategic mode. So one interviewee talked about having a bunker meeting where they were talking about uh, manufacturing metrics, output shift performance, and then an hour later, they're talking about strategies and future uh, direction. So turning our attention then to each of the four quadrants that uh, Breda described. Oh, so championing is the first uh, role, it's a, a divergent role, and it is about communication of strategic options to senior managers in a persistent and a pers uh, per uh, persuasive manner, manner. The trend across this was that middle managers really felt that there was a li little um, point in um, bringing new ideas to senior managers unless they were quite well developed, okay? Because they simply wouldn't get any traction. But the problem is, how do you let the idea uh, become sufficiently developed? And they had a number of different ways of doing this. So one of them was simply to avoid uh, formal controls. So this quote um, illustrates that. So this manager from Tech2, he talked about giving something room to bud and grow. And he referred to uh, bringing it to senior managers would start killing it before the idea gets uh, off the ground. And, you know, for him, it was much better to try and bring it in under the radar and give it sufficient life um, and depth before it gets brought up to senior managers. But in order to do that, they sometimes had to uh, rely on their horizontal networks. So we see an example of horizontal integrative liaison devices for support that Breda uh, talked about. 
So in this next quote, we see that they engage in some unsanctioned transfer of resources. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, for instance, somebody has an idea, I need a developer, I need an engineer. So one of my peer middle managers will provide me with that staff member for a few months in order to get some work um, uh, to get this uh, to start off. They'll give them a little uh, bit of a budget. So what they're doing is that they're lending support to each other in an unsanctioned way. So they're innovating under the radar. They're not asking for permission, but afterwards, once the idea is fleshed out enough, then they'll ask for forgiveness. So other ways that uh, managers kind of managed this process of um, getting ideas sufficiently uh, developed was sometimes they were able to get quasi support from senior managers um, in terms of navigating the formal controls. <coughs> we had one engineer talk about this um, and he took any opportunity that he could um, to persuade his uh, direct superior to lend support, okay? So he wasn't taking no for an answer. He was very much um, getting unwritten uh, sanction to develop the idea. In this particular case, as the next quote shows, he took the budget and he blew it all uh, within the first six months of the year. So in blowing the budget, um, you know, he got unsanctioned support um, from his um, supervisor to do that. So the supervisor was willing to take the risk and turn uh, a blind eye uh, to, to that. Others uh, interviewees talked about um, information asymmetry between senior and middle managers, particularly in um, very much um, new ideas. These are very much unscripted in nature. And they took advantage of that, that senior managers weren't necessarily able to visualize the process. And that gave them a little bit of a leeway in terms of taking a direction on things. They do things like setting fairly woolly or indistinct uh, project uh, objectives to give them a little bit of maneuver room to get an idea uh, off the ground. But in general, what we found was that there was less scope for informal controls, uh, that organizations are tending very much to uh, have a centralized and a very much formalized approach to managing new ideas. The day of having your own uh, budget for innovation within your own department seems uh, to very much uh, be gone. What's happening now is that or, uh, individuals, if they have an idea, must apply for sponsorship, go through a very much a centralized uh, process. And this, as the next quote illustrates, was very much seen as an imperfect substitute. This particular engineer, <clears throat> he talked about having a lot of informal projects and those informal projects were run off his maintenance budget. So that was giving him scope to explore different ideas. But that in recent times had become uh, uh, very much um, frowned upon. It was no longer possible. And what they now had to do was bring a business case, convince senior managers and follow a very centralized and formal, um, formalized process. And the problem with that was that the engineers, the real tech heads, didn't want to take on the red tape associated with this. So it was in, it seen very much as uh, being inhibiting um, their creativity and their ability uh, to innovate. Okay, so moving on to uh, the second of the divergent roles of middle managers, that's facilitating adaptability. And as Breda uh, mentioned, that's about supporting subordinate activities outside of the formal roles so that they're alert to changing uh, conditions. 
So what we very much found here in terms of uh, controls was it, it's, it's about loosening the budgets, loosening the timeframes, giving subordinates a little bit of space and time to progress ideas, respecting them when they come and they bring new ideas, and informally creating an open door policy and creating a culture where people come forward with ideas, where they, there is an attitude that you should continually question uh, things, that if you have an idea, if you have a better way, come and say it. Uh, so th those quotes uh, illustrate that. If they come with an idea, giving them a little bit of space and time from their everyday jobs will just help uh, get uh, that idea um, and, and thinking about how we do things differently. In terms then of the uh, third role, the third role is implementing. That is the convergent activity of middle managers. And in that, as Breda mentioned, there are activities that align organize, organization with senior managers' strategic intention. And very much as we would expect, we found uh, the prominence of formal controls. So uh, Brida has talked about those, the budgets, the metrics, the scorecards, the balance scorecards, all of those were very prominent. That is because there is a need for performance feedback and measurement system to ensure that the organization is on track to meet uh, its uh, targets. Middle managers are under relentless pressure to manage these metrics, and they work consistently and unwavering uh, in, in, in pursuit of these things. But what they did talk about was sometimes something coming in left to field. So a strategic customer or a strategic project being brought in um, without really uh, the bandwidth uh, to cover it. So they aired a sense of frustration about that because it put their budgets, uh, their machine schedules, their labor schedules out of sync, okay? Uh, so they had to try and do a lot of um, rescheduling. It caused a lot of disruption uh, to existing customers um, in order to accommodate, accommodate this new strategic project coming in. So they were left very much with cleaning up uh, the mess and rescheduling around that. We also see a role uh, within implementing for informal controls. There was very much a sense of cam camaraderie. We work together, we collaborate, we work hard, uh, we're cohesive, but it's very much an empathy, an empathy around quarter end, around uh, meeting uh, month end targets, avoiding red flags, working together, helping each other out. We see that middle managers very much had a role in making company values more relatable. So Brida mentioned about mission statement, value statements and so forth. So that is really the remit of senior managers. They talk about company values, they instill um, that uh, within the organization and they cascade that down. And often those uh, situations or occasions uh, can be very formal, like town hall meetings and occasions like that. Middle managers really made it uh, their role to advise subordinates, the operational level, about where they fit in to the company values, about where they can contribute, about informing them at, about the key messages from the top of the organization and how they relate. And often we even found them making local le level mantras and taglines. So little things like better than ever or no compromise, just to try and create a sense of fun or enthusiasm around these values and making them uh, their own. The final um, activity or the second of the convergent activities is around synthesizing um, activities. So in that they gather, they interpret, and they report to top managers on information which may uh, impact on future strategy. 
we really found a, a clear role for the informal integrative liaison devices, that horizontal interaction uh, across uh, different um, departments were very fruitful in helping uh, this. So managers or our interviewees had different ways of describing this. So for instance, one manager in uh, Tech One talked about having regular shoot the breeze meetings. Another spoke about smoke the carpet sessions. So these were uh, meetings that were set up with other middle managers across different um, functional areas, having no set agenda, but the opportunity to talk things through, to get input, uh, to calibrate ideas, thinking, get a contact, to follow something up. Um, and it is all about continual talking. OK, so start talking, pick up the phone, ring around, collaborate, continual sharing. The corridor chats, the evening drinks, of course, the water cooler uh, chats that we all hear about when we really get some valuable nuggets of information. Uh, our interviewees talked about that. But they also talked about the challenge of bringing new information to senior managers. And the next quote illustrates that. So you have an idea, you bring it to the attention um, of uh, senior managers, but it uh, can be uh, extremely uh, difficult. Sorry, <clears throat> I just uh, lost my connection there for a minute. OK, so they talked very much about um, those um, occasions uh, of synthesizing being really useful, but the real work starts when you bring the information up. In terms of our discussion, um, Brita talked about our overall objective it's to think about how middle managers use different forms of management controls in these diverse roles that they are all involved in. So I suppose we've tried to summarize that here. So looking at the bottom right quadrant, the implementing deliberate strategy, as one would expect, we see a high role for formal controls. So project management systems uh, for budgets, um, scorecard metrics and, and, and so forth. Little opportunity for in, informal controls here. And really, there's little scope for integrative liaison devices with metrics being very much broken down by department. That contrasts very much with the bottom left quadrant, the synthesizing information, where we really see uh, informal controls coming to the fore um, and uh, a real focus on the benefits of having occasions for these integrative liaison devices. So to be able to have these meetings with no agendas where we're able to um, share information um, and ideas with our colleagues from uh, different functional areas. Within championing alternatives, we see very much, much more formality being brought in in current times, less opportunity for informal, under the radar, but they're still through integrative liaison devices managing um, uh, uh, to, I, I suppose, do some work or precursive work under uh, the radar. But as Breda talked about, there's very much within this Floyd and Woldridge <clears throat> quadrants, there it's very much focused on the upward and downward uh, direction. And we see a, a strong role for the horizontal uh, relationships are key and important and management control systems uh, can allow uh, can allow these to happen and, and facilitate them uh, very much. OK, so just summing up uh, some of our other uh, discussion points, um, we see the presence of both uh, formal and informal controls and the role of informal controls uh, tends to vary. So we see some complementary uh, effect where uh, middle managers they informally take on the role of um, permeating the values um, 
from senior managers and imbuing, I suppose, them within their department. Where does our department fit in uh, to this? So that's uh, very much a complementary effect. We see a senior manager allowing some flexibility in early stage design, turning a blind eye to that very upfront budget spending and giving their middle manager some backing. OK, so whilst they're not sanctioning this in any formal way, uh, they're allowing it, uh, I, I suppose, by uh, turning a blind eye to it. We see some substitution effect. Uh, we see some increased bureaucracy uh, coming in. Um, so uh, in terms of um, having to get some sponsorship uh, for uh, new ideas uh, in the organization, that's very much seen as having an inhibiting uh, effect. So we're seeing some loosening of uh, informal uh, controls uh, to allow that to happen. In terms of uh, evasion of management control systems, that's very uh, prevalent in championing activities, although becoming uh, much more uh, difficult. We see some unsanctioned sharing of resources, sharing of budget, sharing of engineering time in order to nurture ideas. That gray area of quasi support facilitating circumvention is interesting where the uh, senior manager allowed the uh, uh, budgetary spend uh, to happen uh, up front. Integrative liaison devices uh, were present. Uh, we see them both formally in the task forces and also informally um, in seeking assistance uh, to bypass the formal management uh, control systems in helping each other out. Uh, so they were uh, very uh, uh, present uh, within our data. Just in terms of uh, sum summarizing then our conclusions. So middle managers are critical. Brida talked about that. They're critical. Uh, they, um, I suppose, are involved in so many tasks. And they're very much the backbone of um, contemporary organizations. As our data suggests, they engage with lots of different forms of management control systems as they navigate through their different roles. So each of these roles are important and it's important for us to get an understanding of how and what forms of managing, management controls support them or guide them in these different tasks. We illustrate how the, both the formal and the informal controls can be mobilized, they can be shaped, uh, made a little bit pliable if necessary, or indeed evaded uh, to get things to happen. We illuminate how integrative liaison devices working with our peer colleagues, keeping an open door uh, policy, sharing of information, um, and having those networks are really pivotal, pivotal in realizing the different goals that uh, middle managers have. We identify a number of areas uh, for future research. Um, indeed, that gray area where you have quasi support uh, from your senior manager, or indeed the conditions uh, in which we can evade uh, formal management uh, control systems are interesting and uh, uh, offer uh, future uh, potential in terms of other uh, studies. So we're very happy to take any feedback or questions. Um, and we'd uh, really welcome um, your thoughts. Thanks. So I see we have a question. Emer has asked about the implications of hybrid and remote working for informal controls. and. I think that's a really interesting one. I think there's lots of scope for studies there. Um, it's quite interesting. Some researchers I was talking to who started work in that area were finding that they had predictions around increased use of results controls and less reliance on kind of informal controls because people weren't around. It was harder to spread the values. So it became more important, but they weren't finding any changes. And I suppose they were concluding that 
you know, maybe they'd gone in a little bit too early into companies where companies were just scrambling to, to deal with it all and hadn't really made changes around their control systems. Um, but likely there would be more changes in that area. So for sure, it's it's a, a, a fruitful for, for another study on that. The, this data was all collected pre-COVID, um, so it hadn't any implications there. And then the power effects of various controls, that wasn't something we looked at. I mean, obviously, in terms even of the middle managers and which functions they were in and all of that, it, some would, would have a more powerful role than others. So um, that would have a, a, an impact, but it wasn't something that we looked at. So, Trisha, do you want to take that one maybe about whether the informal, so the next one to Jennifer, thank you, on whether the informal controls were deliberate and, and conscious in managers' actions, um, or, or was it just part of what they do in their role without them being really conscious that they were using informal controls? And, and if, if they were, what was their motivation, I guess, for using the informal controls? Were they really trying to deliver on the goals of the strategy? Or was it just more local that they were just within their own team trying to achieve what they needed to do and get support from the team so they had an easier life? So, so it's a good question on, on how conscious they were of it and whether it was to, to fulfill the organization's goals or, or just the team's goals. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it was very much about, you know, our site. Um, we have to make sure that we go back to corporate with a good set of results at the end of every month and at the end of every quarter. So informally, we're continually keeping the lines of communication open with our peer managers on site. Sometimes it was almost, I'd say perhaps driven by their personalities. Some people, were just very social, this idea of talking, finding out what the problems were, getting input from other people, that, that was almost part of their personality that they didn't um, realize maybe uh, that they did it. And then other times it, 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 it was quite deliberate. Let's make sure that we're continually talking to uh, uh, our other functional areas, that there's a real interdependence between us all and that we can really help each other out and that no, um, maybe one department can uh, pursue an opportunity. So for example, I could do something in engineering, but I need the backup or um, support maybe from quality to come in. So I have to get them on board. So it, it, it's all the time about, keeping that uh, synergy, that connectivity um, open. Okay, um, one from Emer on, on uh, whether we can extend the framework to include upward, downward and horizontal controls. And I think that's a really good suggestion. It's one where mm. we're trying to figure out at the moment yeah. on the contribution and, and what we can, what's of value here. Um, always difficult, of course, when you start extending a framework. Um, but I think for sure around the control systems, whether we extend Floyd and Woodridge or whether we talk more around the control systems um, and, and how the control systems are operating in those three different directions, I think that is an important thing that's coming out because that horizontal one seems to be very important, that network that middle managers are forming with their peers and how that's helping them to get flexibility in the, in the control systems and, and um, sometimes evade the formal controls or operate under the radar. And um, the next one from Josephine, I don't know if you want to take it, Tricia, about how do you define senior management? Do you consider headquarters, particularly in terms of values and missions interpreted by middle managers? Mm. Yeah, so um, we interviewed middle managers and our definition for middle managers was um, that they were senior within the site. So um, the, the, the locations um, that we went to and that they were probably, if you looked at the hierarchy of the organization, that they were um, very much situated in, in, in the middle of it um, uh, with uh, 
a senior manager has been very much at corporate uh, level. Yeah. Um, and I, was there a second part to that question? Because I can't actually see it there. Oh, oh sorry, it's in the chat function. Oh, it's in the chat. Oh, oh yeah, just in the headquarters in terms of the values and missions interpreted by middle managers. But yeah. Yeah. And um, generally speaking, the the mission and values were coming from headquarters. And sometimes um, we found that they were kind of being quite localized. Um, so that was taken, but they were being articulated in a way that made them much more relatable within um, the perhaps the site or within the functional area sometimes as well. Um, and Elaine has raised one, which is a good one on the, the, this kind of hub and spoke model where if you were dealing with branch structures, that they might feel more ownership of their controls and that structure. And I think that we still, even though we weren't dealing with branches, I think we could see that in our data where some middle managers um, really saw the unit as their own and they tried to have a slightly maybe different culture in that unit. Than, so some of them talked about, you know, making fun of the, 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 the taglines or whatever, but using that in a powerful way in their own team. So they, they saw their team as a little bit different to Anna and probably operated as a more senior manager, nearly in the sense of felt that ownership. Um, but I think that it would be a really interesting kind of contrast where um, there is much more ownership around branches and, and different kind of structures in the hub and spoke one. Um, and Imer has asked, uh, to what extent did the typology determine your approach to data analysis? Um, so I think it did, it, we use certainly the typology to guide our analysis in terms of the four different roles. Um, we we were alert or should kind of to other things that we said, OK, are there things not fitting within this typology? But in general, I think it captured the activities. What it wasn't capturing, I suppose, is that horizontal, the horizontal things going on. But it was capturing, it was quite well capturing the upward and downward. Um, it was at those horizontal ones between peers that, that weren't exactly determined within the, the typology. Mm. And sometimes it was a little bit difficult, you know, the, it wasn't so clear cut between championing and facilitating role. It's, it can be quite difficult to say that's definitely championing, that's facilitating, you know, they, the lines can be blurred a little bit. So it, yeah. Okay, and Josephine has given us a link there to strategic activities and, and multinational subsidiaries. I haven't come across that paper. Um, okay, thanks, Josephine. Yeah. So great. No, thanks for that, Josephine. That's great. Um, okay, so thanks very much to everybody. That's been fantastic. It's, it's great to get an airing of a paper and to try and, and make sense of the ideas. Even the whole thing of presenting it has helped us bring along the paper and try and get things a little bit more clearly. And it's a, it's a paper we continue to work on the ideas to try and tease out our contribution better. But um, for sure, it's been great. And, and all the questions have been great for us to, to yeah. work through it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Angela. Yeah.